WB. Thanks, everybody, for joining us this morning. We are about to begin. Who is responsible for personal asset security in Web3? Thefts, hacks, and phishing scams have been an issue since Web 2 first existed. The problem is exacerbated in Web 3 because there are so many additional vulnerabilities with smart contracts and digital wallets. The main difference between Web 3 and Web 2 personal security? In Web 3, it only takes a single click to lose everything you own. As businesses from gaming and entertainment industries to enterprise and DeFi platforms actively explore Web 3 payment processes and currency options, the question becomes, who is responsible for protecting the user's assets? Is it the individual or the brand? Spoiler alert, both are. Individuals need to be savvy about the risks and businesses and brands should innovate responsibly, making built-in security frameworks a priority. Brittany Mieri Tehran, head of business development for Harpy, hopes to bridge the gap, sharing best practices and strategies for how brands and individuals can make safer decisions while trading, gaming, and interacting in the digital age. This talk will discuss the most common risk factors for personal asset security in Web3, from social engineering and payload app scams to website hijacking and phishing to simple human error and social media misinformation. Brittany is joining us from Harpy as the head of business development, the company that created the first on-chain firewall preventing hacks, scams, and theft. She specializes in enterprise-grade blockchain security solutions and is passionate about public goods projects that focus on onboarding the next generation to Web3. Previously a leader in the consumer technology industry, she was recently listed as one of the 40 under 40 and honored with the title Woman to Watch at CES 2022. Brittany is an avid ETH Global Hackathon participant, competing alongside her two daughters, where they have won multiple bounties from Polygon, Lens, Wallet Connect, Optimism, Chainlink, and LivePeer. We're happy to have you, Brittany. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Hello, hello. My name is Brittany, um, and as was just mentioned, I'm here from Harpy. So today we're going to talk about personal asset safety and security in Web3. So quick show of hands. I know we don't have like a ton of people in here today, but... Um, Web3, is anyone familiar with the term? All right, cool. And you can really discreetly raise your hand. Does anyone want a 101 on what blockchain is in general? Okay. Secret, I'm going to give you one anyway because usually people are too embarrassed to ask. All right, so Web3 is possible with blockchain. Um, so essentially, this next iteration of the internet allows us to interact with the content online in completely different ways. Um, and specifically transferable digital assets create an ownership economy. So what is Web3? In Web1, Web that was when we were just absorbing what was on the internet, right? So things were published there and we can go there and access it. Um, now in Web2, we're used to things like social media and we actually contribute our own content to the internet. Um, with Web3, um, and if you're really keeping track of web topics, now we're already talking about Web5, um, but with at least Web3, now you can actually read, write, and own. So you're absorbing information that's on the internet, you're contributing content to it, but also you actually own that information. So when you're posting to Facebook or posting to Twitter, that would actually be content pieces that you own, and if you moved platforms, they could move with you. Um, so with that, Web3 vulnerabilities are real. Um, the crypto scam economy is a very, very robust uh, situation. Um, it's very important to be aware of personal security and platform security as well. So inside the crypto scam economy, um, first off, it's probably way worse than you think. <laughs> um, scans are extremely plausible and highly sophisticated. Um, this past year was a record-breaking year for crypto scams, and honestly, we can expect to just see that continue to, you know, break new records every year um, as more assets and adoption come through. Um, and then also, the majority of attacks actually target the user error. Um, so they are really counting on you to be tricked um, or basically played into giving away your assets or information. Um, there are so many ways to lose. I mean, there's front-end attacks, bait-and-scam sites, private key theft, phishing attacks, social engineering, and honestly, uh, one of my personal favorites, straight-up accidental transfers. Um, so securing personal assets. Um, it's really important when you're starting to think about security that you start with triangulation. Um, even me up here today as a security professional should not be your only point of reference for using any recommendations I give. You should always take whatever information is given to you and then triangulate that with at least two other points. So that could be a community that you're involved with or another professional adjacent to the space. Um, also, prevention. 
Um, so what steps can you take before the SVU incident happens to stop that asset loss? Um, and then of course backup. So if all else fails, you messed up, you have sort of obliterated your security preventative measures, then what happens? So triangulation, you really have to assume that anything free, anything that sounds too good to be true, just blatantly is. Um, sketchy URLs, Twitter names that use an O instead of a zero. I mean, the really basic stuff, it, it's, it's not too basic to trick you. It's not too basic to trick CTOs. It's not too basic to trick CTOs in crypto. Um, this stuff happens every day and they're not always directly targeted attacks. Um, check social. I uh, always highly recommend going to any social sites that they point to and not just looking at their follower engagement, or their follower metrics, but also their actual engagement metrics. Um, and especially in Web3 and crypto, you have to be very careful because we're literally inventing things every day. Um, there's not a ton of information on what is currently bad out there. Um, and sometimes influencers are incentivized to talk about something that they may not know is malicious. They may know it's malicious and just not care. Um, and they may not even qualify to be able to tell if they are perpetuating something that is bad or dangerous to their, um, their followers. So again, triangulating, um, but also just being careful of the influencer economy. Um, and then also just checking out the company's educational resources. Um, are they providing you with the tools that you need to really understand what they're doing? You know, is their white paper published? Is their code open source? Have their contracts be audited? Um, so I come from a company called Harpy. Um, and I'm going to explain a little bit about what we're doing. It's a pretty good overview on just preventative security tactics in general. Um, and agnosticity is a little bit challenging because, like I said, in crypto, we invent things every day. So there's just not a lot of people doing all of these things. Um, but one really good thing, again, preventative measures, stopping yourself from getting drained in the first place, is address scanning. So if you are going to interact with a contract, um, you've gotten through to it, you're working on something and you're going to interact with it, it's always good to use an address checker. Um, so we make a free address scanning tool and you can go right to the website, you can put an, an address in there and it'll tell you a little bit more about that information. Two-factor authorization. So we're used to this for our banks and credit cards today, right? You are traveling um, or you're in a new state, you're swiping your card a lot, you're you're running your debit card ATMs and you get that text message from your bank or your creditor. And they are verifying that that is actually something you're trying to do. Um, we need those sort of implementation and preventative measures in crypto as well. And you're starting to see them released and invented these days. Um, and then also loss prevention. So we talked about like triangulating and preventing, but like what happens if all that goes wrong? So different measures that will allow you to actually save your assets once they're already being stolen from your wallet. Um, so address scanning basically digital assets with less uncertainty. Previously, we really had no information. If you clicked on a link to connect your wallet, you were gonna sign a transaction, unless you were reading uh, the little bit of code notes at the bottom of it, or you were doing some serious research, you were really just holding your breath and hoping that it wasn't a malicious contract or it hadn't been altered. Um, so now you can go to a website, you can actually type that address in. It takes a couple extra steps to actually do that research when you're interacting. But it's extremely important to do it because, you know, one wrong click, unfortunately, in crypto today means you can lose a lot more than just the things you thought you were interacting with. Um, so on our address scanner specifically, we can kind of tell you a little bit more about what that address was. And then it's a tool that we built out to enterprises. So if there are metaverse projects or gaming projects or something like that, we actually built out our malicious transaction API so that it can be uh, accessed on the back end. So if you're building any sort of crypto project and you want to be able to send a flag to any of your users before they sign a transaction or you just want to allow those not to go through, um, this would allow you to do that. So two-factor auth. Um, it seems silly, silly and straightforward, honestly. I think sometimes the things that we have, uh, we take for granted in new iterations of an economy. So two-factor auth. Um, for those of you that are a little bit more crypto native, this requires an RPC layer. Um, so you're assign essentially signing onto another network and this allows you to see what that transaction would be doing. And if it's going to, uh, if basically if it looks sketchy, we'll send an email to your address and you'd have to click the button for the transaction to go through. The same way your credit card will get declined until you reply yes to that text message or other similar measures. 
So loss prevention. Um, this is front running to secure assets from hackers. Um, like I said, things are invented all the time in crypto. Uh, this is a technology that we created back at ETH Denver in 2022. Um, it is what we ultimately got our, our funding and backing for. And it's pretty cool because uh, what we've done is actually uh, flipped hacker technology on hackers. So where hackers used to be able to essentially pay a higher gas fee to run their transaction before yours, um, we use an approval for all transactions. So you would go to your um, Harpy dashboard and you would pick a token that you're gonna protect and set up safe addresses. And if at any time, any assets are leaving your wallet to one of those addresses that you didn't deem safe. So this means you tried everything, right? You have a cold wallet, which we didn't talk about today. So there's some assumption there that you know what that is. Um, but you're using a cold wallet. Your seed phrase is stored offline. You know, you've got all these measures set up. Something went wrong. Someone broke into your house. Your seed phrase was gotten. And now your assets are leaving your wallet. Well, what we do is we're actually monitoring the blockchain so quickly that we can see that transaction happening and actually steal those assets from the hackers as they're leaving. So this is the prevention of theft as it's already happened. So they did get into your wallet, they did take your assets, and they're working on getting your assets to their personal wallet. And actually, we were able to figure out a way to seize those assets and then put it into a non-custodial wallet. So what that means is there is a wallet that's set up um, when you go through the setup process, and it's non-custodial, which means that Harpy as an entity, we don't have any access to this wallet, only you do. Um, and you know, being a smart contract, uh, this is all on chain and our contracts are audited for this. Um, and essentially, if your assets are being stolen, um, we detect this in this uh, little example, I used USDC, which is um, a one-one stable coin. And uh, you would move that USDC away from your wallet before the transaction completes. And then by the time the malicious transaction executes, your USDC has already been moved out of your wallet and it actually can't go through. Um, so this was sort of our flagship technology that we started with and what got us into general security tooling um, today. I will say that uh, being in security, I have started to learn that security is the sexiest after it happens. You know, people love watching the train wreck. Like there's a reason SVU is a popular show and murder podcasts are just always at the top of the charts. You know, people like just keeping their eyes wide open after something's gone wrong. Um, what I spend a lot of my time doing is reminding people that, you know, while that's really fun to watch, it's, it's really interesting to watch the train wreck. Um, it's way better for your personal sanity uh, if you set up preventative measures before. So we talked a little bit about personal asset safety, but if you are working on a project and your project involves a metaverse or NFTs or you're doing uh, NFT gaming or anything like that, it's really important to not just think from the consumer level, but now you are, you are engaging with digital assets and you have users that are going to feel that you are responsible for their digital assets. Um, whether that is technically true or not depends a lot on how on-chain your gaming is, how, um, how your NFTs are set up, are they actually stored on-chain, are they pointing back to a Web2 server? But all of that basically comes back to thinking these things through before you're having to deal with them. Because when you're having to triage a security situation, let's say you launched an AR gaming platform, you have NFT gaming inside of it, people are earning tokens while they're gaming, you have all these vulnerabilities that now allow your users to be interesting to hackers, especially if your platform's taking off. So sometimes you don't experience these thefts or attacks until you've already grown. Um, like we work closely with a company called Azra Games. Uh, they have the IP for doing Star Wars on chain, but they also have other games and they have NFTs that are your avatars and that's essentially your entire digital entity. So if you build up this, uh, this player and it becomes very valuable, uh, people are getting tricked out of there. They're called hopefuls. And ultimately, you know, sometimes the gaming platform will buy them back from the marketplace. Sometimes the community will buy it back, but that's really not the solution. The solution is to think about security ahead of time and know what preventative measures you've built in for your platform and your project, but also what measures you are incentivizing and gamifying for your customers to set up for themselves as well. Um, we see some really cool like in-app adoption and things like that. Um, 
So why is it important to think about it before you have any issues? Because once you've already launched your project, if you deal with a security issue, um, you're, you're creating way more barriers to adoption. Um, we're very early in Web3 digital assets and crypto, and any bad experience usually takes your customers back several steps. Um, and lawsuit exposure. Um, there's a lot of you know, Twitter spaces and podcasts and panels about legality in Web3 and crypto, and it's sort of the same thing as the technology. Uh, it's being changed and invented and shifted every single day. So keeping up to date with what's going on there and your legal team as well. Um, also, if you develop something really great and then you suffer a big scam, you might create a catalyst for additional regulatory measures. Um, we see that all the time. We see that with the implosions of centralized exchanges, and it could be really real for your project or something you're trying to build. And then, of course, reputational damage. Uh, it's really hard to walk away from some of those things if people feel like they were made vulnerable by your company. Uh, they're really unlikely to shift that feeling. They're more likely to find a different provider. Uh, so community, community matters uh, because crypto happens in real time. Uh, like I was saying, you know, just in the time from when I made these slides to when I'm here presenting, new scams have been created, new attacks have happened. Things happen in real time, and we just don't have a lot of published resources unless you're scanning Git books daily and, you know, looking through some, you know, Twitter chats that are not available to everybody. You know, there's lots of these security chats that are just for us professionals. Um, so surrounding yourself with knowledgeable professionals, um, whether that's specifically like a Web3 consultant um, or just being engaged with a community that is looking at security in Web3. And, you know, you get some benefits from that, like a virtual neighborhood watch. Uh, you need to be aligned with a security professional in Web3 if you want to know what the latest scams and attacks are, unless you're planning to look at Twitter, you know, every 15 seconds. Um, I know in Web2 that the adoption of Twitter has changed a lot. In crypto, it's still our absolute main platform for communication. Um, if you want anything going on in crypto or the newest information, you have to get on Twitter. Um, LinkedIn's going to be out of date. Facebook is basically non grata, and Instagram is mostly for onboarding people to Web3 and then moving them to Twitter. Um, so if you do engage yourself with a community or a consultant or have a dedicated security pro, um, exploit detection, just that general neighborhood watch feeling. Um, continuous security enhancement, like you know what tools and protocols are available and you get to get set up with them first. Um, and then also just trust and transparency. When you have to triangulate information like we were talking about before, this gives you another uh, person or community to triangulate with. Um, so security community, this is a little bit of an example about how we make sure that our community is protected uh, when Ledger decides to launch a firmware update that computer completely changes um, how your seed phrase is stored. We are there to sort of help you sift through the PR announcements that they're doing and really understand what security is available for you and, and what vulnerabilities you need to be aware of. Um, and then also things like airdrops and mints, um, making sure that our Discord community always has the latest information. Um, so that is our talk on Web3 vulnerabilities and how real they are. Um, crypto scam economy, personal security, and platform security. Um, this is a little bit about who we work with, uh, so whether that's an NFT community and artists, uh, game and metaverse developers, treasuries, crypto holders, family offices, retail investors, things like that. Um, and uh, thank you for joining. Uh, I'm not sure if any of you guys are fully immersed or even beginning to be immersed in crypto, but I do have a PO app available if anyone wants a PO app. Uh, that's basically our proof of attendance in the crypto world, and it signifies that you've done this talk, um, and you can actually carry that around as proof in the future. Um, feel free to reach out via my email with any questions that you might have, um, and at the bottom there, you can see a little bit about our backers um, at Harpy and how we do what we do. So, thank you, everybody. I actually have four minutes. I always go over. Does anyone have any questions? Um, I was just curious on the loss prevention example that you used. How does Harpy actually detect if uh, a transaction comes in? Yeah. Uh, I was just curious on the loss prevention example you showed. Like, how does Harpy actually detect if a transaction is not legitimate? If someone like steals my seed phrase and tries to steal all my stuff, and you'll like 
to you know, send it somewhere else? How do, you, how do you detect what is a good or bad transaction? So when you set up your dashboard, um, you'll be asked a couple things, like do you participate in DeFi? Are you using NFT marketplaces and things like that? Which will allow you to automatically whitelist major platforms like you know, OpenSea or Coinbase um, or you know, widely used uh, contracts that we're aware of. And then you can also add any personal ones in there. So if you have a friend, a partner, a spouse that you usually send uh, assets to, you can whitelist those as well. So if any asset that you've protected is going to anything besides there, so you're not using OpenSea, it's not going to your partner, it's not going to your child, um, then that's when it goes to the vault. So basically there's a white, there's a, a white list of network of addresses. Does anyone else have any questions? All right, well, cool. Um, so I have a client who, uh, I can't say who it is, but it's a big brand that everyone knows that did something in Decentraland. Um, and so they bought land in Decentraland, mm -hmm. and I was curious to ask them what they did with their seed phrase. And to my best understanding, it's like in, it's like written on a piece of paper in the desk of an intern, and that's like their entire security around their seed phrase. I was wondering if you could like speak to like what you should talk to like these big companies that they're like, oh, Decentraland, I gotta do like a marketing thing in there. Is there a better way to manage something like that? Yes, <laughs> there's about a thousand better ways than that. Um, I wish I was entirely shocked by that, but it's, it's all too normal. Um, for something like that, I'd recommend a multi-sig like Gnosis Safe, oh sorry, they've rebranded to just Safe now, um, but it's formerly called Gnosis Safe. That would be a multi-sig wallet. So that basically means that several people need to sign on it. Um, the actual seed phrase like you're talking about, that would theoretically be best in hands in like the CFO um, or whoever has the, the bank account. And theoretically they should be the one creating the seed phase storing it in hard copy wherever the company's assets are stored physically, if there's a security deposit box, there should be more than one copy of that too, because if that deposit box is compromised or if there's some sort of fire and it doesn't make it through it, um, there's no other way to get those assets back. So definitely not in the intern's draw. Um, if they get it from the intern, don't snap a picture with it with the phone because our, you know, our photos are fully read these days in in-text. Um, but hard copy, I highly recommend steel. Uh, some people diamond engrave on metal, but always to have some sort of metal backup as well. Um, so between a multi-sig and a proper storage of a seed phrase, they'd be in a much better position. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. All right, I appreciate your time, guys. Um, feel free to reach out if you have any other questions and have a great show. Great, thank you so much, Brittany. Appreciate your time.